And we'll have five presentations today that highlight a number of innovative uses of DHIS2, and they actually just happen to be from all over the continent of Africa. Um, so this one we're calling our Africa Spotlight session. And starting us off today, um, Tariken Nagesa from the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. Hopefully he will be joining us in person in Oslo soon. Um, have submitted an amazing story around the Sakota Declaration and how they use DHIS2 as a multi-sectoral multi platform for an all of government approach to improve nutrition outcomes. So I'm going to go ahead and make you full screen and uh, the floor is yours, Tarakan, if you can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, you have about 12 minutes, okay? Okay, great. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody in the auditorium as well as on the virtual meeting. This is Tarakan from Ministry of Health. I'm going to present the role of DHIS and uh, its use across uh, multi-sectorial in Ethiopia in case of Sakota Declaration. So uh, is it my screen is visible for you? My sp my screen is visible for you. So we see your screen. It's just not in full screen view, but we do see it. Okay, great. So this is how this is the reckon. I'm just as Rebecca introducing me. I'm working in the Ministry of Health and Nutrition Coordination Office. Uh, especially uh, I'm the monitoring and evaluation mm, professional. So uh, coming to the Ethiopia, just I will give you some highlight on the Ethiopian nutritional program, especially Ethiopia is burdened by three uh, the triple burdens, which is undernutrition, micronutrient deficiency, as well as uh, just uh, over uh, nutrition from the Ethiopian Public Health Assessment of 2023, this is how the stunting, wasting and underweight and overweight is saturated in Ethiopia. So uh, this is uh, the situation that uh, if we figure out if this stunting, almost 7 million people, 7, 7 million children are uh, under stunting. And then to, to elevate and to afford these uh, problems, the Ministry of Health, in collaboration with its implementing sectors, we have a lot of strategy policies, not only in health, but other across the education, agricultural, uh, women, the social affairs. So we have a policy, we have a strategy, we have guidelines, and then we are fighting and against this uh, the, the the curse of generation called stunting and then other uh, malnutrition form. So when we are coming to Sekota, um, let me give you the, 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 the explanation for Sekota. Sekota is one of the Wereda, the area in the northern part of Ethiopia, which is very, very, you know, ample of malnutrition, that especially stunting was there. So the government of Ethiopia was committed to end this uh, stunting in 2013, and then which is uh, aimed to save seven, almost 8 million uh, and, uh, through the 15 years in three phases. Uh, let me tell you about the phases. This is the, the first phase from 16 to 20. The second phase is 21 to 33, which is called expansion phase. And then the other is national scale. -up. So these are the, the sectors which are involving in sector declaration implementation. And then in federal, we are this, this sector declaration, uh, the government commitment is led by the deputy prime minister. And then in the regional, it is led by the regional uh, Presidents, and then Tarakan, there are. Tarakan, can you please try yes. to re-share your PowerPoint because I don't think it's moving with you. Okay. Okay. We're okay. still stuck on an earlier slide. Really. Okay. Let me share it again. Okay, perfect. We see it now. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. So uh, this has three expansion, three phases: innovation phase, expansion phase, and the scale up phase. 
So in this phase, there are the sectors who are uh, you know, operating this, and then it is led by the deputy prime minister in the national level and the president by the regional level. And these are the innovations. Uh, PDU or pro program delivery unit, community lab, data uh, revolution, agricultural water technology, costed water data plan, and first thousand days. These are the in innovations that we are very near and working to improve those the problem. So from the innovation phase, we have this success. The financial allocation from the federal government and the regional government is increasing from 19 to 20, 20 of the uh, Gregorian calendar. And then there are gender responsive plan, which is uh, poultry, goats, and then uh, the gardens, waters available near to the mothers uh, just to not consume their time. There are eight schools. Most of the schools are, you know, for uh, uh, students. And then the other are, there are a lot of uh, kids are, kids looked at, prevented almost 1,000 child deaths in Tigray and Amara because this innovation phase are tested in Tigray and Amara, which is the biggest region, especially Amara is the second biggest region in country. Tigray is the place where this Sakota is uh, situated. And then we avert almost 100,000 stunting cases in the uh, two Waradas. And then uh, the other is in 2020, in an expansion phase, we have conducted uh, the evaluation using a list model and almost 60,000 60, 60, kids are uh, saved from uh, stunting. So when we come to uh, dealing with how DHI is operating this multi-sectoral food and nutrition information system, as you see, one of our uh, innovation in Sakota Declaration is uh, data revolution, which is aimed to data avail and use for, the, for policy making, resource mobilization, and monitoring the progress. So, uh, implementing web based and manual system drives culture to data use for decision making, uh, collecting, analyzing, and using real data for multi sectorial information system for reduction of uh, stunting. Uh, this UNIS, we say that UNIS, Unified Nutrition Information System for Ethiopia, which is called multi-sectorial data platform integrated with uh, district uh, DHIS2, which is uh, monitored by the Federal Minister of Health. And it's it's start from the Kabele level, the so-called the community level, and they come to the federal level. So we say that this, it is a multi-sectorial food and nutrition information data solution. We say that this DHIS is a multi-sectoral food and nutrition data solution for our case. So why we integrate this multi-sectoral nutrition to so important? Because there is a lack of comprehensive and integrated data management system. Data revolution is one of the government commitment and then one of the initiation for vital nutrition data transformation in the country. The data is poorly collected, managed, and uh, it's not uh, sounding for decision making, especially for those who are implementing this Sakota declaration, non-health sector, agriculture, education, water and energy minister, women and the social affairs. So the other is capture data and inform. This NIPIN is one of the uh, national information platform for nutrition, which is the working for the secondary data. This is how, how many indicators are in the units and then how the data are uh, oscillated. If you saw this, uh, you are not maybe familiar with that. Of the first one is the Ministry of Health. This is the Ministry of Health. This is Agriculture. These are the other ministers and then how they are operating. So these are Kabele level. There are a lot of indicator, monthly, quarterly, biannual, and I am by annual reporting. And then the Woreda, the so-called most of uh, the other country call this Woreda as a district. Region is region or province. Federal is national level. So in each level, there are a lot of indicators. Almost 119 indicators are there. And then there are 170 Woredas trained on this uh, multi-sectoral nutrition information management. So these are the example how this uh, DHIS produce the nutrition, multi-sectoral nutrition information system across the level, across the sectors. So this is a very peculiar 
because it gives you a visualization. You know, most of you are familiar with DHIS. How we integrate DHIS across the other sectors is very important and peculiar experience on this uh, secondary declaration that the Ethiopian Food and Nutrition Information uh, System. So, Sorry, can this... yes. Sorry, again, this will be your two minute warning, okay? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the other thing is how integrating climate change and the nutrition. Climate change and the nutrition. In Sakuta Declaration, there is priority climate smart intervention because to increase the production, productivity, and the consumption of locally available nutrition dense uh, crops. The other is small scale li li livelihood ownership. That's as you, you see previously in the picture, there are goat uh, gardens and then uh, folteries. The other is uh, improved, improved climate, resilient water supply, uh, quality and the quantity, improved access to high, uh, hygiene sanitation facility, and the improved delivery of direct nutrition intervention, the environmental and social safeguards, uh, climate change, which is considered to integrate part of the Secular Declaration. The other is a multi-sectorial approach for stunting reduction. It's called, we call MASRE. is one of the uh, climate resilient, uh, just we are working in the, in the uh, Amhara region as test. And the other climate resilient infrastructures are mitigating the climate change. There was we, we, replacement of the gas oil through the water pump. So it reduced uh, greenhouse gas emission. And the other thing is Ethiopia is a part of GG or what you call a global uh, green, global growth for green initiatives. And uh, our prime minister is, he is one of the uh, great model for this green legacy. And then he is always yearly, we have planting a lot of uh, planting trees, which is a uh, nutrition interface and then it is also resilient for nutrition climate. So the other thing is how assess risk and the plan for better preparedness of the nutrition. We have a protein information system, the so-called uh, smart survey, nutrition uh, emergency preparedness and the response plan in the EPHI, Ethiopian Public Health, and then what is what is put Wereda classification, which is uh, you know agriculture, health, EPH, other partners predicting the food and the drought, food security uh, seasonal assessment using household economic analysis tools, which estimate consumption, income, and expenditure by annually. The other, which is uh, not as matured, but uh, decision support modeling tool for Ethiopia, DHSME, which is a research project, which is using uh, using different uh, machine reading, a joint collaboration, which is uh, the American uh, organization supporting the Ethiopia. The other thing Targan, is... Targan, you only have one minute, so please wrap up, and then we have to move on to the next presenter, okay? Okay, this is how the nutrition financing is working, and the lesson is the government uh, uh, commitment, digitalization, and the other thing. So the next attention for us is uh, academia donors who are participating here uh, in the auditorium as well as in the virtual. We are calling up you to support this special and then a good uh, initiative to save the lives of the kids. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you all. Thank you, Tarakan. fantastic examples of how DHIS2 can really support the cross-sectoral collaboration. So our next presentation we have coming from East Africa, our uh, partners Rachel pa Powers uh, will be presenting a fascinating abstract. I love this one because it really brings together how DHIS2 as a TBK surveillance registry could then bring in together adherence tools like the smart pillbox. And we're going to hear from Rachel a little more about how that interoperability solution worked and what was the impact.
working with partners in the field. Lisa Engelbert, the Milford Seigneury, and also um, Philip uh, Gonzalo, who make this innovation happen. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. So the challenge that we were looking to solve was that we needed to link data from smart pill boxes. This is a smart pill box um, used for TB treatment directly into the electronic tuberculosis and leprosy register in Tanzania, which is based on DHIs too. Yeah. Okay. So we are trying to do this to improve system sustainability of the TB program. We wanted to improve technical flexibility of the infrastructure um, to improve efficiency of the TB health program and overall um, have a positive impact for persons undergoing TB treatment. And the idea was we wanted to do this specifically for Tanzania, but building it in DHIS2 in such a way that it can also be utilized by other settings in the future. Just a, so the quick background, I'll explain what digital adherence technology or DATs are. So these are digital tools that are utilizing, um, it can be sensors or mobile phone, it can use a computer, um, but basically it helps support persons that are undergoing treatment uh, where you have daily dosing and it supports by giving adherence information around that daily dosing and sharing it with platforms. The great thing about DATs is that it increases the opportunity for patient-centered care. So especially in TB treatment, if we look at how this was traditionally approached, it involved persons having to come to a facility in person every day and being observed um, taking their, their anti-TB uh, medication. But giving something like in a box or via cell phone really improves the remote support for patients and it improves the flexibility of a program to be able to provide uh, follow-up. I also wanted to mention that, especially in the last six or seven years or so, there's been a huge surge in the use of digital adherence technologies um, in, in Africa, but also worldwide. And there's also growing evidence uh, from research around DATs and growing guidance from institutions like WHO on how to use support tools, such as a smart pillbox, to support patients in their treatment. We saw, also saw the, the real effects of this in the COVID pandemic, where treatment moved a lot away from facilities and more towards home-based settings. And something like the smart pillbox is helping provide um, care to patients, provide flexibility, but also making sure that the data around that daily adherence is also getting to the healthcare workers. So when we're looking at this approach, we think about the product. So in this case, the smart pillbox, it needs to feed that data into a platform. So in this case, we're talking about um, DHIS2 tracker. And then we think about the system. So what we're using this data for, we are using it to, um, of course, support patients. That's the, the first approach, but we also use it to empower healthcare workers with real-time data um, to support patient follow-up. We are looking at how we can use that data for analysis and patterns. Good to go. So we want to use this data to be able to do analysis and tracking patterns, um, not just for the program, but understanding if there are certain groups of people, um, gender, socioeconomic um, levels that need additional support. We can do that looking at demographic data and then the adherence data. We want to provide data for data-driven dri decision-making to stakeholders at the, at the ministries of health. And we also want to make sure we're enabling integrated systems. So we're not just having a bunch of different tools that aren't really working together. Oh, now it's not advancing. You just need to move the mouse back over to this, this main, I think. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the smart pillbox, I'll just give a, an example of how it works. So this is a smart pillbox. Um, it's produced by a company called WisePill. They're based in South Africa. I'll stay by the mic. 
Um, the basically the anti uh, TB pills are stored inside the box. It's used as just a, as a pill container. But there's also a module here that's enabled with a, a electronic SIM and also a microprocessor. And this is the brain of the box, and it's doing the actual sending of, of data. So when a client um, is ready to take their their TB medication for the day, they open the box. There's a there's a beep there. Um, they take their medication, and there's a magnet here that senses the opening, and it stores that information about the opening on the, uh, the on the module itself. It also syncs that data via the eSIM to the main platform. Now, the, there's an API that was developed by the manufacturer WisePill. This was also done in partnership with KNCV. And what we've done in our work with HISP Tanzania is to make sure that we can um, adopt this this um, API, get it working in DHIS2 Tracker, and get the data from every box opening into DHIS2 Tracker and into ETL. So looking at how this is all set up together, um, if you look first at the, the list of IMEI numbers down here in the corner, so that is each uh, module is, is given its own uh, unique ID, that's the IMEI number. Once a country, once Tanzania receives all of the boxes, that is those numbers are loaded up in bulk into ETL um, for availability to register to a patient. So then if we go up here to page, patient registration place, this is where the healthcare worker orients the patient on their treatment, orients the patient on how to use the box, and they also log into ETL to assign that patient to an IMEI number. And we assign the patient via an episode. So whenever a patient begins treatment, uh, a, new, a, a new course of treatment on TB, that's given a unique episode ID, and that a unique ID is linked to the unique IMEI number. So then when the patient is using the DAT device, they're opening the box, it's getting synced to the platform, and all of this data is going via tracker into ETL. From there, we get to see adherence patterns. We have calendars. I'll show you in just a moment, a more detailed view. And we also, of course, have the reporting around um, uh, large scale use of the box. So for those of you who, who might not be familiar with ETL, this is a little bit of an overview of, of what that is currently um, doing in Tanzania. So uh, it's the electronic TB and leprosy uh, register or system, and it uses tracker capture to register patients that are suspected of having TB and to also um, track the notified patients with TB. It's used to follow up on treatment and also sample testing and logging of um, outcomes for TB. Now, what we've created with, with the adherence app, which is what we're calling it, within DHIS2, means that we can um, manage the boxes themselves. So we can we can actually change settings remotely on the box. We can also see the dosing calendars that are based on that real-time data uploading of the openings of the box per patient. And we can also see overviews of, uh, of a particular facility or of a particular region. And we also, of course, look at the reports that are coming out of that. One thing that I wanted to highlight here is that although we're using a, we have the, the mediator, which is what the box is talking to before it talks to ETL, but the only information that's stored there is the IMEI number of the device and this episode ID. So there's actually no patient data that's being shared externally. It's all um, just being stored in ETL. And uh, so our, our colleagues from his Tanzania wanted me to make sure I emphasize how easy this is to set up. So <laughs> if you are interested in using the Adherence app in Tracker, um, configuration is simple. It's available already on, um, on GitHub and you can install it, configure it, and it's ready to use. And you can also grab some of our his Tanzania colleagues here if you want to ask more technical questions about that. But just looking at some of the other um, uh, integration pieces here. Um, we talked about the device assignment via this unique IMEI number. We also can change the alarm settings for the box. So actually, you you may have heard the beeping before. There's also a functionality in the box where at a certain time every day, the alarm goes off to remind someone to, uh, to either prompt them to take their medication or maybe you set it later in the day. And if they've forgotten to open the box, then it goes off as a, as a reminder. It can also be configured for um, refill appointments. So if someone needs to come get more medication, maybe once every two weeks or once a month, you can do that. And it also gets information on things like battery level um, and other device details. Thanks. Um, 
I'll show you a bit more of this from screenshots, but we're looking at adherence overviews, uh, device management in the app. Um, yeah, so this is a view of the, the patient summary. So we have here, you see a list of, I think it's the five um, patients that are in a particular facility. And you have here their, their treatment information, patient number, their name, also the battery level of the device. Uh, that's a really exciting thing that we've been, at, been able to upload. And then on the very right-hand side, you see this summary adherence streak. So it's showing the last seven days, um, whether that um, patient opened the box to take their medication or not. If you filter into a specific patient, you can also see their personal calendar and you can also go to the specific device information. And this is the view where when you are registering a patient, um, the, the person using the system will get a drop-down list. They can start typing the IMEI number. It's quite long, so it's then um, pre-populated with, with the numbers that you can choose from. And this is only available if the device is not currently assigned to someone. This is one of my favorite things. I mentioned it before. This is the setting of the alarms. So you can have it be every day, or maybe it's only during... Um, during uh, weekdays, for example. Um, you can also set appointment reminders. And this is synced remotely with the box. You don't need to bring it in and plug it in and, and sync it. Um, and you might be wondering, well, what happens if, if someone is not opening the box at all? How do you get the that new device setting? The boxes are actually communicating with the platform every day, regardless of whether it's being opened or not. It sends what's called a heartbeat. And that is when it gets any updates that have been uh, configured on the platform. We also have reports, but I think you're probably all familiar with DHIS2 reports. Um, so just looking to how we're actually um, using this in Tanzania in, in partnership with NTLP. So the benefits of using this, or building this integration between the boxes and ETL are that it's going to save the NTP over 40,000 USD per year. And that's based on the cost of the external platform that, um, that, that NTLP had been using with the Ascent project, so that was a platform called Everwell. And it was a great platform, but it was external and um, quite expensive. And now because we're able to do the boxes directly into ETL, those costs are saved. Of course, it also eliminates duplication of efforts and parallel data entry for healthcare workers themselves. Um, it helps streamline the training. So rather than having to use two different platforms, healthcare workers <clears throat> can use the existing ETL and also do that patient management around adherence and it supports the shift in the use of DHIS2 as more of a management system rather than just a reporting system. So looking forward now in the coming months, um, there are several improvements that are being rolled out in Tanzania for DHIS2, uh, the TB, P, TB prevention app, the gene expert connection and the community app, and also now this smart pillbox integration with the adherence app. So that'll be happening in the coming months. And the plan is that the NTP will utilize boxes to support patients on the new uh, shorter treatment regimen, which is a big development in the TB field. And that will be around 300 to 400 patients per year. Just to mention previously in Tanzania, there were also projects that the Ascent project supported around 4,000 patients uh, on use of the box. And now this, because of the built-in sustainability with DHIS2, um, it's going to be a lot easier to do that in the future. So if you have any other questions, you can come find me or my colleague Baraka and uh, reach us on email. And thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Rachel and Baraka, and also my His Tanzania colleagues. I want to know why it's only on GitHub and not on the Apps Hub. Where do you want people to find this app? So this is very important around local innovations is that we want to share these innovations. Our uh, next presentation, we have, oh, my cheat sheet, Data Use in Action. So another another group supporting uh, Tanzania. So University of Dar es Salaam, uh, Joseph Fox, if you're ready. Uh, fantastic presentation coming your way around how to actually make more interoperability solutions actually have impact this time by controlling the pull rate based on malaria cases. So let me pull up your slide and make sure I remember to share it as well this time.
the screen sharing working fine? Or do I need to reshare? Okay, floor is yours. I'll give you a two-minute warning. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, yeah, as the Udism Data Tool Lab, we are happy to uh, present it to you. Uh, one of the initiative uh, that we uh, we implemented when we had a problem with malaria commodities, uh, specifically uh, alcohol consumption uh, versus positive uh, or confirmed malaria cases that are happening uh, from health facilities. So it's called balancing ordering of malaria commodities. Uh, this is what is the actual consumption using the DHS2 routine uh, malaria treatment data. So uh, in Tanzania, uh, we have uh, different systems that captures uh, the commodities or logistic information uh, with the service data. Basically, the service data are being captured by the DHS2 ecosystem. Uh, we call it HMIS DHS2. Uh, basically, it is comprised of uh, a number of systems, uh, including the aggregate a system which we call it the data warehouse because now it can integrate with uh, ETL, the TB and the LEPROS system uh, together with uh, the IDSL uh, surveillance uh, system. So in that regard, uh, it means we, we now have service data within our DHSO system or ecosystem, but we do not have uh, the logistic information uh, into this uh, DHS2 ecosystem. So when uh, people from health facilities order, uh, let's say, alu or drugs or commodities, uh, there is no connection between amount of drugs that was previously used during service provision or the amount of drugs that was dispensed uh, with the amount of drug or commodities that this particular person uh, wanted to order uh, for, for his or her facility. So. Uh, LMIS now, with the core part of ensuring now we can we can balance uh, the, the amount of drugs that this particular person could uh, could order. So we know with LMIS uh, we have integration with the health facility registry health facility registry system, but also uh, the DHSO system also linked to the HFR system. So this was the center also of uh, considering the interoperability uh, base uh, for the data flow between the two systems. So the problem that we had is uh, during supervisions uh, that were done by the NMCP, this is National Malaria Control Program, uh, revealed that the amount of commodities that are being ordered by public health facilities is the triple the amount of confirmed malaria cases. So we had, a, as the minister had some kind of suspect, is it a data quality issue or people uh, trying to, 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 to steal drugs and stuff? So what they did, uh, what we did is, or what the ministry did is to, first, they had a guideline uh, and introduced the guideline to these public facilities to streamline uh, reporting of all commodities uh, from a mixing of having strips, some facility reporting using strips, other reporting uh, using tablets. Because this was one of the suspects that the ministry had, maybe it's because some people are reporting using strips, uh, some tablets, so we cannot uh, get the actual number that is exactly, that is in terms of tablets or in terms of strips. So you can see the, the tools that were was being used previously before the improvement, uh, but now we are going to see uh, what uh, was improved at least to address, in spite of having 
uh, this column showing people should report in strips, but people are reporting in tablets. So now uh, the problem still existed after several months of uh, having this kind of uh, improvement. So this is an architecture diagram of what is happening between uh, the systems uh, that capture the service data, which is the HMIS DHS2, and the systems that capture commodities. You have, we have a medical store department uh, having an APICA system that capture commodities. Through health facility registry, this uh, system communicates. So LMIS has commodities from uh, MSB. Uh, these commodities, of course, uh, are moving to HMIS, DHS2, but not linked to whatever order that uh, has facility to replace. So now it means we are, we are kind of missing a connection between the commodities coming to, DH, to DHIS versus service data that are being captured at DHS2. So this is what uh, ministry tried to, to introduce a guideline to ensure that people, all of the health facility report using strips, but the problem uh, at some months is still persisted. So what was missing is now the service data to go into ELMIS so that uh, we can have some kind of validations at ELMIS to prevent uh, ordering uh, more drugs. So the approach was uh, first the ministry uh, divided the four ALU categories in terms of uh, the ratio to the positive confirmed malaria cases. So it's like overall ALU uh, contribute uh, one one by four ALU contribute uh, this particular percent. Two by four contribute this percent. Uh, or ratio to the total uh, arrow dispensed or to the total uh, malaria cases. So with this kind of approach now, what we had to do is to produce uh, the number of cases in terms of this percentage from total confirmed cases from DHS2, because people uh, will report confirmed cases. Take an example, 100. So we divide the 100, the 100 cases into 23, 22 by specific ALUs. So depending on the priority of the ALUs that ministry focus, now the division of the total number of malaria cases will focus to the particular priority uh, ALU. Take an example, the priority ALU is three by four, then when we divide the total cases into respective ratio, we start with taking the 19 percent of the total cases, follow up by, uh, the, by a particular order. So after dividing these uh, malaria, positive malaria cases into this respective percentage, uh, now these data are being sent to ELMIS. They are being sent to ELMIS uh, periodically uh, periodically after every month, but sending data for previous two months. Because in LMIS, people are ordering drugs for two months. So now what we do is, uh, taking an example for this June at the 25th, we are going to send service data from HMIS. Uh, <coughs> we are going to send service data from HMIS to LMIS for data reported in April, uh, and May. So now when somebody at 1st of July uh, in LMIS want to order uh, the commodity for ALU, this service data will limit this particular person to exceed the particular number of drugs to order. So at LMIS, this particular number, take an example for 100 clients, we divided into 23 for ALU 1 by 4, then ELMIS is going to add a particular factor that was agreed by the ministry to prevent this particular person. Let's say the factor is added to uh, amount of two, then it's going to be 25. So somebody cannot order for the next two months as more than 25. And this is linked also to the uh, R and R form where someone will, will have to enter the data 
for uh, for the amount of drugs that remained in store. So in combination of these two, now we can be able to validate uh, the ALU request from service data that were captured by DHIS. So on this particular integration of pushing service data to LMIS, uh, we use, we have linked it with the DHS2 uh, notification of feedback and message module where now uh, relevant people can see the uh, the amount of the data that we are sent to LMIS for establishing the controls. So you can see now we, you can see also we have the, an attachment of the data of patients for all public health facilities that we are sent to LMIS for preventing them to order more than that. So, so the impact now was, uh, you can see from this uh, graph, mine uh, from the left, uh, cases, in 2022, I mean, uh, allo dispensed to confirmed malaria cases was 3.6 ratio. But now you can see the ratio has changed up to almost one, as you can see here. So this was kind of an outlier for this particular month. And this outlier wasn't a data quality because uh, the ministry checked for data quality issues and didn't find. But rather, it was due to missing validations to prevent people from ordering more than that. So now we can see uh, for 2023, uh, the ALU uh, ratio is almost uh, uh, around uh, one. So what are the op opportunities that we've had is now uh, the ministry, uh, I mean National Malaria Control Program are looking for us to uh, add more validation to a testonate injection because now also it has more than 1.5 in terms of dispense the attestinate injection to positive uh, admission uh, malaria cases. So we are looking to that, but also family planning have had uh, a problem with uh, more of commodities being uh, reported as used uh, compared to the actual commodities that this facility took from MSD or from uh, ELMA, yes. So if they took 100, they report 200 people were given a particular commodity in the family plan. So now we, we want to reverse the kind of an approach in terms of validation. Now to take what was ordered from ELMIS into DHIS. Now from DHIS, when they are reporting, you can check the quality of data. Now, why are you reporting 200 while uh, you got 100? So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Joseph, for this presentation. And I think it's pretty obvious that this kind of principles can be applied across many different types of commodities, not limited to malaria programs. I think there's probably a lot of room for follow-up questions. So I hope everyone finds each other after the coffee break. Um, our next presenter, it's gonna be Coffee Siliera, if you'd like to come up. Let me get things set up for you. Okay, coffee, the floor is yours. Coffee here from his WCA to share some of the innovative work around more cross-sector cross collaboration, this time in Togo and really looking at a community level. I'll give you the two minute warning, okay? Has helped 
Yes, regarding the community time. Uh, the power of digitalization has not been used sufficiently to inform surveillance and also response. And also, we have not sufficiently leveraged on uh, the cross sectoral collaboration to make sure that we are sharing data and we are responding uh, efficiently to uh, outbreaks. So that's why we, in uh, an integrated experience, bringing together the three sectors health, uh, human health, animal health and environmental health to build an integrated system uh, that was uh, supported by the World Bank. We had four objectives. First one is to foster data sharing across the three sectors. Secondly, to build a common data uh, visualization point, enable collaboration, and also unlock data use, especially having common data products having joint investigation, data collaboration across the three sectors, and also uh, inform policy in an, in an integrated manner. So how do we design the system? So we have a metadata dictionary, then we, have, we, we went through a series of configuration workshops. We configured an event program into a joint form for the notification of all the three sectors. So now on the ground, people from the ground notify on one single form, be it from uh, human health, animal health, or, or environmental, environmental health, is one single form. We added three separate aggregate forms to kind of uh, share data from the three sectors. We configured uh, a, a bunch of indicators as well, and configured some users. Uh, in the organization, hierarchy, we had the Okay, uh, we had several uh, arguments that we had having uh, almost 5,000 5, uh, sites pages from where we were able to record the base data. So uh, this is the, the harmonized form, very simple because we want it to be usable at the community level, not uh, healthcare practitioners. These are people that are uh, uh, ordinary people that are not familiar with our health uh, terminology. So we built a very simple one, and then they they have to submit it uh, immediately when they the the. Uh, the event or the unusual event is um, detected. So to design it, we have all these sectors that are proposed uh, for, then we bring them together, and then we brought community health workers, uh, echo guard or rangers, if you will, we brought them together to see which make, which one would make sense the most for them. And then from this experience, we went on field testing to see how they and that's how we finally ended up with this form. Uh, here are the, uh, some aggregate forms that we configured for each sector. And uh, the difference is that uh, health, uh, animal health and uh, environmental health are sharing this monthly, while human health is sharing it uh, um, weekly. So we configured a few outputs. For example, these are the notifications that selected people will receive whenever a notification pops up in the system. And this notification goes to all the three sectors uh, simultaneously. We have several dash dashboards. Some of them are sector specific. Some of them are joint dashboard for them. And then we have also configured uh, one health bulletin that is uh, shared um, by annually. And then it's a joint bulletin where we have all the information uh, together. And we developed, of course, uh, several training material to uh, to do capacity building. Uh, we also configured a uh, gateway, a transfer gateway between the HMI, National Health and the one-time systems that we can 
avoid double data entry. And then we also have uh, uh, ongoing discussion with those two sectors because they don't have currently a digitalized system for the data. Now they. So uh, they are likely to have their own where they can put data. So regarding the, the, the planning set up uh, a joint committee set up by the Ministry of Health, and that committee was uh, chaired by the Ministry of Health because we had that long sequence of paychecks in using, and then we agreed on a good roadmap with both planning like we have some meetings, have dialogues, and also updates with the, the work that the image of training of the rangers back in the forest. Have a very kind of place of all region. When you come to go and visit, it's very uh, fantastic, but also uh, a huge uh, place where we have a lot of students, students that are coming from. So we can send all the students, and uh, they are every round for to the equipment that we have purchased and uh, a mobile phone and data connection, share data. And uh, here are some images of our capacity building uh, session. Yeah. A few results. Then we have this dash door that uh, share that door because we have got it on the Now, this will help the city of the institution. Animal, uh, have they all see the same that they can add, uh, they can uh, act together. Uh, and uh, so far, we have uh, done uh, upload to uh, 15 month data system, taken uh, 15 system alerts, which have been verified. We have some indicators to see how many alerts have been verified in the 48, in 48 uh, hours. And each one has been investigated and confirmed in two days. Uh, also, we, uh, we were able to follow this of our system and then do the success that we had. We got a nine month extension of the project and uh, we developed with the World, World Bank. We are negotiating to scale it up uh, across the country. So, we started with three districts of our. 39 districts all around the country. Some challenges are uh, to data quality. Uh, of course, it's, uh, I'm really happy I've seen uh, some features that will help us uh, toward that. Uh, we also have not included some features like lab sampling, monitoring, a joint response from the, from the three teams, and also forecasting regarding the unusual. Uh, events. Uh, we had some challenges regarding the planning also. Uh, uh, we also have the, the problem of, uh, I would say, uh, digitalization of data from other sectors. While the, the, the health sector is very tight with DHS2, the other sectors are still struggling with Excel file, another the data condition. And this is something that we are trying to address to them. Uh, again, we have that sustainability from currently the, the, the system is powered by the World Bank. Of course, we have national contributions to the personnel and so on, but we are hugely relying on the World Bank, having discussion with the government to see if we can have some funding there. But how can we successfully do this if our countries, our governments, not able to put money on the table to make this uh, uh, be a non ownership thing, and this is something we still need to address. Uh, to conclude, we say that this project based experience that uh, brought together three sectors, collaborate on one health uh, on the community based approach, and we can see data availability and sharing, enhance the collaboration, and also better monitoring the response to actual events. Uh, substantial effort has been needed to sustain also the system and also sustain it across the country, even if I come from um, in other countries. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Theory, who is uh, the director of the GMI Sector Group, 
and his team that are there. Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel from the Global Fund in Togo, and Mr. Uru, uh, who managed the technical infrastructure in Japan. And did them by my boss. Uh, <laughs> and also my magic brother. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so very much, Coffee, for being a fantastic messenger, and also to Dr. Teori, who also our colleagues here. One of the great things about innovations is sometimes the higher levels you go, we talk about event-based surveillance a lot in terms of the animal health sector, the public health sector, but when you really bring it down to local innovations, I think approaches like this, where it's innovative and community-driven, um, are really an interesting way to look forward. And with that, I will also uh, encourage that uh, those who are interested in One Health, Animal Health, there is a session on Wednesday at 1 p.m., I believe, with my colleague Stefano, uh, with a number of use cases around that. So I highly encourage you to join as well. And our final presentation, which I believe might mean we have a little time for uh, Q&A at the end. I'm inviting my colleagues Stefano Perotti and Patrick Omiel is here as well, or no? Ah, there he is, Patrick. And this is another fantastic uh, example of local global innovation in the sense that uh, there were some very real needs emerging out of the um, Ebola crisis. Let's make sure I do this one right this time share. Maybe someone can confirm that it's sharing. And really being able to leverage the HIST network in the global DHIS2 community to actually take some of the work that's being done in countries and transform these into uh, global tools, make them available to others uh, to reuse and relearn. So without further ado, I will hand over to my colleagues. Do you need a, or you'll just go back and forth? Okay. I hope they, they can hear me well. So uh, thank you very much, Rebecca, for your introduction. Uh, I'm Stefano Perotti. I'm working with um, the Global Implementation Team. I'm sure all of you knows very well that uh, one of the product uh, within DHIS2 as well is the what we call the toolkits. Okay, so it's really create a kind of uh, metadata it's not fully packaged, but metadata products with the old documentation and lesson learned and implementation in the field. So what we are really trying to do and what we are going to explain today is how we are going to uh, gather lesson learned and a good practice experience on the field and try to generalize and create a global product. And specifically for this project was uh, initiated with the, the CDC, specifically the branch for the emergency response capacity team, that there was uh, this there was a need that was identified uh, on the digitaliz digitalization of emergency response team rosters. So we really saw this an opportunity to leverage uh, what was already been done in the countries uh, and gather some lesson learned in production of a global uh, toolkit. Um, there was established a technical working group. Okay, so over the last uh, the last year and a half, of uh, well over more than 120 attendees from uh, MOH, CDC expert, uh, East groups, and other organization uh, came to this uh, technical working group. They shared their experience and the needs as well. So we had a series of six uh, virtual technical work, uh, working group meetings that were translated in um, English, French, and Portuguese. And the, the main objective as I was saying was really trying to gather the experience from uh, uh, from all the different uh, uh, implementation, gather as well the requirements, okay, to be able to inform a global product, uh, and then design and implement uh, one uh, uh, one of these. Uh, here, just providing a snapshot uh, why we are trying to do this uh, in DHS2, because as we well know, DHS2 is uh, widely used. Uh, for uh, uh, for surveillance, so why not have this part of response in the same platform in which we are already um, which we are already tackling everything already with the with the surveillance? Here, just give a little bit of a snapshot because I, I don't know if everyone is uh, um, used to the terms of a rapid response team and roster management. So a rapid response system is really a multidisciplinary teams that uh, the main role is really to 
uh, to be able to rapidly respond to a public health emergency. It can be Ebola, can be cholera, can be any other type of, of, uh, of outbreaks. It's a multidisciplinary and it's very important the coordination roles uh, on that. And as well, a roster management, well, a roster is really a kind of, yeah, it's, it's an image of a, of a line list. So we'll be able to, um, to identify and select the correct people for uh, uh, for a correct position for a specific type uh, of interventions. So what we really did was really trying to get uh, a a specific use case that it was from Uganda that the Patrick is going to uh, to present to us uh, and trying to gather their lessons learned together with the others from other countries to inform a global project. So please, Patrick, the floor is yours. So thank you, uh, uh, Pat Patrick Komiel is my name uh, from uh, HISP Uganda. So as uh, Stefano already mentioned, yeah, so it was a collaboration really to learn from uh, what's happening in the country and then contribute to that uh, bigger technical working group. Uh, because, you know, up here, people may not know really what happens in the country. So as uh, HISP Uganda, we've been uh, working closely with the uh, Minister of Health. We've been supporting surveillance. Uh, actually, we are, we are supporting the uh, running of the, uh, the surveillance um, system, uh, the e, uh, e, EIDSR. So, uh, but, so EIDSR has been running for some time now and that supports surveillance. And uh, that's where in case we have uh, emergency or outbreaks or the usual notification happens with the EIDSR, which is a DHIS to base system. But to be able to manage a roster, it was another thing altogether. Yeah, so we, what happens in countries that you have uh, the, the, the emergency operational center which basically uh, manages the operations whenever you have outbreaks, but also they're on standby. But this, the way it's structured is that you have national level, you have regional level, you have district, uh, different response teams. Now to be able to manage that list of uh, people at all those different levels was a bit complicated. So we thought initially that, you know, us being people who are already running the surveillance system that would use the DHIS2 platform to actually manage uh, this list of uh, respondents. But again, these respondents were users of the system because they are the ones who are reporting data. So it was a bit complicated, you know, to get users to be part of your roster list and be able to not notify and manage that. So it became a bit uh, complicated for us. Uh, so we, we made an attempt to come up with something and it was also timely uh, with this work that was uh, coming in uh, for us to do something. So instead of having now uh, the respondents as users, the attempt was now to make respondents as tracked entity instances within DHIS2, whereby you're now registering them as people that you want to track and manage going forward. So that was the kind of dilemma that uh, we had. So, but overall for uh, the Ministry of Health Uganda, for the emergency operation, um, uh, the EOC, really it's, it's a need that would, uh, it's obvious that uh, when you are uh, in emergency, but also routinely, you would want to definitely want to know uh, the people who are who you who you can deploy in, in my in case of an emergency. So you need to have that list, but also you need when you are running and, uh, and uh, when you are there's an outbreak and there's an operation going on, you need to know people you've deployed. How many people have you deployed and where are they? You know. And then the other one also would be for how long you've deployed them. And there was also a bit of incentives because these people are being paid. You need to even know, go, go take it further to know uh, how many people are being paid by who. So that was really the need that was there, but also understanding the skill set that you have uh, and then at these different levels and then maintain that list uh, over time. So, uh, so we attempted to do the first uh, prototype of this and uh, it was really to know, have... Um, a simple tracker system that allows you to register uh, these respondents and then be able to know have different events of deployment. So if I register you each time I deploy you, I'm able to, you know, uh, be able to track that. And so that module, we're able to build that that prototype within the uh, the DHIS to core app, but also realize, you know, how do we quickly register these people? So we thought you know, of having a, a, a portal where people can do some kind of self-registration. Uh, and then once they do self-registration, that information is moved to the DHIS2 and then going forward. So that was the initial model that we quickly designed. And uh, also the other part within, the, 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 within, within this prototype was, of course, the notification. Uh, that, that Then going forward, these people would be notified in case there's an emergency. But also once they're in the field, 
you can maintain that communication. So that was a prototype that we came up with. And then uh, with the technical working group, with the discussions that came along and with support from DHIS2, uh, Stefano and the team now continue to build uh, on that uh, uh, field lesson and the prototype that we had come up with. Thank you very much. So yeah, as they quickly prepare, we click click as well, take it uh, and uh, uh, try to inform uh, based on their experience and the needs were identifying the technical working group, uh, kind of a global product. So here we're doing the, here is just trying to show you a little bit uh, the overall process of a management of a rostering in a, for this specific use case. So normally we always try to start as global team for all the type of toolkits from the analytics, okay? What are their needs? What are the things that you need to monitor and to analyze? In this case, it's really, okay, you have an intervention, which are the skills that are required for this response? So kind of set of skills that need to be uh, collected. The workforce size to understand, okay, you have this type of outbreak, how many people for this specific position for these skills need to be uh, available and deployed? Identify the candidates because each one of the different candidates can have previous experience, previous training. So really need to be able to identify this information to organize them. Selection of candidates, okay. So as well, how the platform can support on the help of selection through notifications, process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then here is where we inform, okay, what should be collected and how the uh, roster should be uh, should be managed. And then as well, there is the very big component of maintenance of the roster. It's not just a snapshot, a photo. It needs to be a video in which you need to update information, update people that uh, arrived, that left, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we identified this. Uh, uh, let's say six different type of uh, key requirements. That is the registration that what was mentioned in Patrick. Sometimes can be supported by the public uh, public portal. A vetting and verification. To really to try and understand, okay, the information that were reported, that the the, uh, the candidate report, we need to first of all verify if they are true or not, and then try to identify which one are the ones that are are, are relevant for uh, for the rostering, the selection of our responder, selection, but as well, um, we need to attribute uh, a role. To this person, because uh, when, uh, for example, in public health uh, during an emergency response, uh, you can be uh, a nurse, but with the experience in uh, management of uh, um, isolation centers or management of a vaccination campaign, etc., etc. So it, as well, the ability to provide uh, and to assign a role to this person. The deployment we need to do uh, to be able to follow up the information related to okay, we have deployed this uh, this person in which. Uh, for for which emergency, the deployment evaluation. So everything that came post deployment. Okay, once the person is back, how was the deployment? Really to try to understand. Okay, this person, uh, how was kind of okay the score that you received during the deployment? So are we going to deploy to other intervention, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? And the analytics. This is extremely important to try to understand the, for the manager, the system administration of um, that you are monitoring this information, trying to understand, okay, do we have enough people? Should we recruit more people? Which are the positions that are missing for the specific intervention? How was the deployment, et cetera, et cetera. So based on this, we built this, uh, uh, this uh, tracker program. Here is a kind of just <laughs> the way how we organize divide by stages, section, et cetera, et cetera. One of the components that I want to highlight is the access of the information. So the sharing settings, because there are some components, the one the, on the stages part, the ones that are blue, uh, that are purple, sorry, that uh, are the information that need to be viewed and modified by the responders, okay? Because finally, the responder, the one that is going to be enrolled, the ones that are going to provide information related to the educational and professional experience and the selection of skills. But then you have all the other parts that are related to the um, to the manager of the emergency rostering. So there is the acceptance, the maintenance, and then the deployment. So as well, there is this component of access to which type of information. And then, um, I don't want to go into detail for every different stage and type, but just want to highlight some uh, uh, some of the points that are, for example, are related with the vetting and acceptance. So, for example, the being able to to build this uh, this program to optimize the acceptance. You will see that uh, we have information that are entered by a candidate, okay, but they need to be revised. The information that can be entered are 
can be very long information related with all your experience, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some key information that need to be highlighted to the person that's going to be validated, this person. If not, they're going to spend one or two hours to the selection of each of the candidates. So for example, here is an example of how you can resume certain information coming from uh, another stage that uh, you don't have uh, access. Um, to improve as well the backing, okay? So for example, be able to have some program rules. So for example, here, the possibility to have, uh, uh, okay, the different practicing license, uh, when is the expiry date, when is expired on the acceptance stage, you know that, okay, this license status is already expired. So based on program rules, so how the program can support us. And then the validation, the acceptance, part that okay this person has been accepted in the in the roster for which position notification another component that were mentioned by it uh, was mentioned by patrick that it was identified specifically for the uganda use case uh, the ability how the the platform can support uh, on the communication between uh, the manager and the uh, and the and the person that is part of the rostering so for example once the person is accepted we receive a notification okay you have been accepted to be part of this rostering. A deployment request, you have been asked to be deployed for this type of integration, take contact with this person, or for a follow-up deployment. So the first two types of notification are for the responder, and the third one is for the supervisor. Say, okay, this person was supposed to uh, finish the, the deployments on this day. Please check. Okay, so these as well are based on uh, experience from, uh, from other organizations. Sometimes we forget people that people were deployed here and there. And uh, and then the last part of analytics, okay? So here are just example of analytics. This toolkit is not based on global standards. As for example, we have other toolkits like HIV tuberculosis that are based on uh, global guidance. Here, this toolkit is based uh, on practical experience, practical examples. So for example, here we have uh, um, a dashboard that can be used to have an overview of uh, all the people that are part of your rostering. So how many submissions have you received? How many were accepted? The uh, the proportion of people that have been accepted, the ones that are available at the moment, how many deployments uh, um, happened until today, which are the roles that are validated, where are located these people, geography. And then we can have other set of dashboards, for example, to be able to monitor specific type of interventions. For example, you say, okay, here an example, a cholera response on this area. Okay, for this. How many deployments happened? Uh, how many people were deployed? How many are actually deployed? How many are waiting to be deployed? The average, uh, the average length of, uh, of deployments of state, because sometimes can be very short intervention, which you need to monitor. For example, Ebola normally should not be more than one month. Other intervention like cholera can be three or more months. Um, then other, for example, how many have uh, contracted an infection during the deployments, so maybe we we need to uh, we need to kind of reassess a little bit the the IP, the infection prevention control measures that are present on this uh, on this intervention. And then last, uh, an example of a line list of all the people that have been deployed for this type uh, of interventions. So here, really, just a presentation about uh, how the we can inform a global toolkit that can be uh, adapted by different. Uh, ministry, different organizations, but it has been that it has been based on practical and real example. And always talking about toolkits, we want to invite you. We will have uh, an expert lounge on the auditorium uh, one, not five. One has changed on Wednesday at uh, at four p.m. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick and Stefano. And thank you to all of the presenters who are so timely. I always get worried when we have five presentations in one session, but we actually have a few minutes left where we can take some uh, questions and answers. Let me get a mic. Just talk into it. Just talk into it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for the presentations. Um, I missed the initial one, so um, so I have just few questions uh, for the one regarding the TB. I don't 
remember now the name. Yeah. Um, no, I just had the curiosity. Is there is there um, a way to supervise like random patients to make sure? Because in, in my experience as as a clinician, let's say, like opening the box doesn't necessarily mean that they took the pills, right? So, um, is there a way? And and what I understood, and I know you have to to do it briefly, so maybe it's there. But I was very curious to know uh, if you just because they open the box, you assume they do the medication, or if if there's a kind of random supervision to count the pills, you know something, because they may have opened and not take the appropriate number. They may have opened the box and sell them. They, I mean, there can so many things can happen that. For me, making the assumption that opening the box is is parallel to taking the medicine um, can can go to can drive to wrong conclusions. That was, and I love the 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 program. Huh? I really love it. But I think that that point uh, was a weakness. Unless there is something that you could not explain. Do, do I do the three questions and then the yes, answer? Yes, maybe quickly though. Sorry, so much time. Ah, we might have to take ah, ah, <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, yeah, with uh, Joseph. Uh, yes. I also loved the, 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 what you presented. Um, have you ever encountered that sometimes um, the ones that, that uh, send the data uh, to be digitized into the HIS? They actually take the data from the pharmacy. So it's actually not data from cases treated, but it's already data from medication, right? That's why we have more number of cases and the coverage is higher than the real ones. So then how do you deal with that? Because then you cannot compare it with the real cases, real treated with, yes, with the LMIS. I, I'm trying to be fast, so maybe I'm not making myself clear, sorry. Um, and then for the last uh, one, um, I also very like very much uh, the, the, the application, but I have a question. Like, um, if I understand it well, that means having a roster for the whole country, that means that you can deploy people from one district to another, yes? That people the, uh, of the district that you're deploying to another one, um, are leaving their posts. So is there like a plan of if that person is gonna be deployed, that uh, colleague is gonna be substituting because we all know that health facilities and hospitals, they might be short staff. So deploying people, then you may have a hole in, you may leave a hole in another place. And why like a national roster and not a district roster where there might be enough staff and trained staff? Thank you. Sorry. Questions? Okay, we'll take two more, then see if we can do a few answers, and then I might allow you guys to take it into coffee break, okay? Merci. Bon, vous me permettez de parler français. Ouais. Bien sûr. Voilà. Merci. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Donc, je suis Daniel du Togo. Euh, J'ai deux questions. La première question, je crois que ça est en lien avec celle qui vient euh, d'être posée, c'est par rapport aux au pilulés que le suivi des patients TB. Euh, un, j'ai compris qu'il y a une batterie dans la boîte qu'il faut recharger. Alors, comment se fera la centralisation des données pas très bien compris. Peut-être que ça a été dit, mais je n'ai pas très bien compris. Euh, deux, est-ce que j'ai compris que ça a été utilisé en Tanzanie? S'il y a une, c'est une phase pilote ou c'est tout le pays qui l'a utilisé? Vraiment, vous pouvez nous en dire davantage. On est intéressé de savoir vu les enjeux. Alors, la, la seconde préoccupation est en lien avec... Euh, le traitement du paludisme, le suivi du traitement du paludisme. Je ne sais plus quel pays il a pas présenté. Je voudrais juste comprendre, est-ce que ce suivi a concerné le niveau communautaire également? J'ai vu qu'il y a eu un suivi 
qui a permis de, vraiment de réduire drastiquement euh, les, les indicateurs. Je veux dire, est-ce que ça a été utilisé au niveau communautaire également? Merci. Then, could you maybe summarize very quickly the question? Just to check if Adam was listening. <laughs> yeah, I think I think his uh, first question. I'm not sure if it was really a question or a, or a comments, but the first one was about uh, the the use of the battery in the in the pillbox, and the second one is about um, how data is uh, being synced. To the, to the central server to get an overview of uh, the, the entire country. And then uh, the, the last question, uh, the last one is about using the, the app that was used to optimize the, the ordering of drugs in malaria, if it was used also in the community or it was just in the health facilities. So to the gentleman who gave a very interesting presentation on the One Health approach in Togo. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, first of all, very, very interesting project. Uh, so congratulations on that. But my question is, uh, you, you mentioned uh, integrating um, uh, lab results into your project in future. Uh, the, so the question is, do you have enough capacity, especially in animal health sector, which is a challenge in many places? Okay, I'm going to stop the questions there. I think, Kofi, maybe you can answer that last one quickly. And then I think I'm going to defer a couple ones to, to those in the coffee break, but take the last one quickly. You, you're pretty right. We fear in this. In, in, in uh, human health, we already have these... Um, uh, the, 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 the system is in place, but for animal health, uh, this is a challenge we are foreseeing, and uh, we have not already touched it. We know that there will be a challenging one, and uh, maybe you have some ideas, and we can talk later and see how we can uh, take that challenge together. Thanks. I will briefly answer kind of your last question, having followed um, the rostering project. So it's not a district or a national. DHIS2 works in a decentralized way. So we would expect many times that districts are managing the roster, but it is within a centralized platform. So it functions at the same time as a district level or a national level. That being said, I don't think the technology will solve every operational problem that you might have, which might be, I have now taken a volunteer off their normal job, now they need to be replaced. Uh, but the goals really specifically for this project was at least to start to get to very two big points, which is one, who are the people in my roster? Are they digitized? Can I find them? And actually two, that CDC did not even expect us to be able to go to, but it actually just worked out really well learning from Uganda was the status of deployment. So being able to kind of solve some of those parts of the problem were still really huge uh, coming from the context where most countries, they either didn't have anything. We talked about six different countries. They either had nothing or they had some Excel sheets floating around. So a little bit. Um, Joseph, I will let you to try to answer a bit about the commodities. It is about to be coffee break. Um, so before I give this to you, I want people to hold their hands so you know who to chase down for your questions. Uh, One Health Coffee is right here. Hold your hand up. Um, Tanzania, UDSM, Malaria, Commodities. Hold your hand up. Everyone, yes, you know who to find. Stefano and uh, Patrick, emergency rostering uh, gurus here, if you'd like to find them. And who am I forgetting, Rachel, with the smart pill boxes, which I think are very, uh, very good questions, but seem to be very much related to the smart pill box technology. So I think finding Rachel after the session will be great. And I will let Joseph out. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, there is a challenge to balance between uh, what happened at the farmers with uh, the positive or the confirmed cases. To us, we are using the confirmed cases. Uh, to 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 push them to ELMA, yes, so that this facility, when they order, uh, we can prevent them from ordering uh, much compared to what is happening. But you can't really control the uh, amount of drugs that will be uh, dispensed to these clients. It's a tricky way. Maybe if we have a way to connect, this is a pharmacy, then we'll have uh, a three-point kind of 
uh, control. Yeah, uh, and for the question from here is we are capturing only the data from um, health facility. So whatever community interventions that will happen, then we are expecting this malaria uh, cases to be reported at the health facility for whatever, uh, for whatever community interventions that will happen, now we can control that. We can only control for what is happening at the health facility. Yes. So thank you so much to all of our presenters. I will let you all go now.